Um, and I think it's two minutes after the hour, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gregory, and I'm the executive director of the Concrete Sustainability Hub here at uh, MIT. And as uh, <clears throat> you may or may not know, we've been around for about 11 years now, and we're a multidisciplinary team of researchers who look at various aspects of concrete sustainability, some issues related to materials, but a lot of them related to the way in which concrete is used in various kinds of structures. And uh, the neat thing about um, this work that I'm going to be presenting today is that in some ways it's kind of a, a culmination of a lot of research that we've been doing over the years on both the materials and the full life cycle of structures that use concrete. And um, it's basically going after this question that we had about what's the role of concrete in um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions for buildings and pavements in the US. And I want to first acknowledge uh, my colleagues who have really put a lot of time into this, uh, postdocs Hassam Azari Jafari, Isan Vahidi, uh, graduate student Feng Di Guo, and then uh, my colleagues Franz Olm and uh, Randy Kershane. And um, I think that uh, uh, a big reason why we um, were uh, interested in this is because you know people know a lot about concrete and that it's the most used building material in the world, but uh, they may not think so much about why. And there are a lot of good reasons. First of all, it's very economical. It can be used in a, a relatively inexpensive uh, way. It's versatile. Uh, it's durable, lasts a long time. Uh, constructible, easy to manufacture and produce in many different ways. Um, it's available uh, uh, most everywhere in the world, uh, and it's also can be very beautiful. And I think one of the exciting things is that um, there's many different types of innovation that's constantly changing concrete's attributes. Um, I think a lot of things that, that, that people don't realize, though, is that concrete's also critical to meeting um, societal goals. And there's a few different type of goals that I'm thinking about. One is related to uh, sustainable development, which is something that uh, most people want. Affordable housing, uh, as you probably know, is a big challenge. And uh, there's a big need for resilient buildings and, uh, and infrastructure. And I want to talk about each one of these in a little bit more depth. With regard to sustainable development, you may have heard of the United Nations Sustainable um, Development Goals. Uh, and it's all of these goals listed here, 1 to 17, related to various aspects of uh, sustainability, related to whether it be poverty or uh, infrastructure or cities. And there was a study that was done recently that looked at the degree to which um, infrastructure would either directly or indirectly influence these. And they found that um, infrastructure did directly or indirectly influence all 17 of the goals, um, and including 121 of the 169 targets within those goals. Um, and infrastructure there is rather broadly, it could be electrical, um, uh, it could be, uh, uh, you know, water, uh, all, all kinds of things, transportation, but as we know, concrete is really a critical part of, of delivering any kinds of those infrastructures. So, so we're going to need concrete literally to help us um, achieve these sustainable development goals. When it comes to um, affordable housing, you know, there's been all kinds of uh, proposals on how we address affordable housing shortage, but almost all of them come back to the fact that we need more housing uh, and concrete's also a critical part of providing that housing. <clears throat> um, when it comes to uh, uh, hazards and natural disasters, the costs are really significant. In 2018, there's $91 billion in estimated losses. Anyone in California right now is well aware um, that there, once again, are significant amounts of um, wildfires. And so if we're going to really mitigate the impacts of all these different types of hazards, we're going to need more resilient construction of our buildings and our infrastructure. And in one way or another, that's also going to uh, rely on concrete. So we, we concrete is, is clearly something that we need, <clears throat> but the sustainability of cement and concrete are often questioned. Uh, you know, you see stuff like this in the media about it being uh, destructive and there are NGOs saying that it's it's failing us. Um, and even uh, some architects saying we should just give up entirely. And I think that missed out the need for it. Um, it also misses out on the fact that, you know, when you look at concrete compared to other materials, it's a pretty low impact um, material. This chart here is showing a variety of different materials plotted according to 
um, embodied carbon dioxide, so the, the, the CO2 associated with producing these materials. And this is the same thing, but just more on an energy scale. And this is a log scale. So 0 0.1 <clears throat> is 10 times smaller than 1 is 10 times smaller than 10. And what you can see is that concrete and even cement are lower than uh, the vast majority of these. So I think that it, that that comes from <clears throat> we need to decouple the material production impact from the volumes that we use. And of course, the fact that we use so much of it means it definitely should be on our radar. But um, but that has a lot to do with that development that we're um, talking about. Okay. <clears throat> now the other thing I think to keep in mind when it comes to um, uh, sustainability related issues is that you know the use of concrete influences the life cycle of the structures in which it's used. Um, so for example, the life cycle environmental impacts of pavements or buildings um, that we can target materials production phase to try to lower environmental impacts. We can also use design and construction methods to lower those impacts. Um, but there's also a use phase associated with buildings where we have energy consumption and vehicles. We have fuel consumption on pavements. Um, and then there's also um, an end of life. So the way we use concrete, obviously the, the embodied impacts of uh, producing it, which is usually this materials production and then um, construction, that will affect environmental impacts. But if we think about the whole life in this use phase, the way we um, design our buildings and pavements affects its use phase. Um, and so as a consequence, it's important for us to take that life cycle perspective beyond just the uh, materials, okay? So I think we, we kind of have a crux here where the use of concrete represents uh, a, a tension and that tension is sustainable development. We literally want, uh, uh, development for economic reasons, but also I would argue for equity reasons uh, as, as well, <clears throat> particularly when we look at developing countries, right? They can and should have um, the same level of, uh, of infrastructure that, that we have in, in developed countries, but we need that to be sustainable, right? So we need the material, but we also need to lower impacts and that's gonna be a challenge. And so that's one that we wanted to kind of dive right into and, and try and answer this question about, you know, basically can we support sustainable development while meeting greenhouse gas emission targets? And um, what I'm showing here is a chart from uh, this organization, uh, Climate Action Tracker, that shows United States uh, greenhouse gas emissions here. And um, th this here we are today in 2020. So these right here are historical emissions. These bars right here are basically various targets. Um, so black is if we allowed a four degrees Celsius temperature increase worldwide, red is less than four degrees C, less than three, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, obviously, the the, um, the the cooler the colors you go, the, the the cooler associated with temperatures, right? So these are all different schemes that we we need or should hit in order to meet these targets. And here's 2050, um, where you can see basically even getting to zero emissions, they consider to be um, you know just barely uh, <clears throat> um, acceptable in terms of three degrees C or two degrees C. Now. For, for context, um, when the US participated in the Paris agreements, um, they set a target of 65 to 75% reduction from 2017. So that would put us, um, right now our, our greenhouse gas emissions are about six gigatons, and this would put us in the two-ish um, gigatons uh, range. Now, obviously we haven't ratified that uh, treaty as a, a country, so I realize it's a, it's a target, um, but you know, uh, things, things can change. Certainly there, there are states and municipalities that are trying to go after it. So I still think it's worthwhile, at least as a measure for us to um, compare. Now, um, uh, but 65, 70% even still is obviously, I think most people would agree is a significant um, reduction from where we are uh, today, even if it is, you know, uh, several decades in the future. Now, coming back to cement and concrete, I think one of the unique things about it is that really when we look at um, our greenhouse gas emissions by end use um, sector, and the three major sectors are shown here, transportation, transportation, 
buildings, and then um, industrial emissions. This right here is, is fossil fuel combustion, where they've allocated electricity, uh, fossil fuel combustion with electricity to these three sector, sectors. So it, it doesn't include everything, it's mostly CO2, but still this is most of the US greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, cement and concrete affect all three of these. The production of cement is uh, is really within this uh, industrial sector there. It's it's um, uh, between one and 2% of those emissions. Um, and then, but obviously the buildings, uh, almost all of them are made with some amount of concrete. And similarly with transportation, we use concrete in our, our pavements and our bridges and, uh, and other things as well. So yeah, I think it's interesting case because it does affect um, all three of these um, sectors. So this brings us back to our, our question, what is the role of concrete in US um, greenhouse gas emission reductions? Uh, and we are gonna focus on buildings and pavements. They uh, represent, uh, you know, like over two thirds of the use of uh, cement at least uh, in this country. So we're, we're looking at the vast majority of, um, of application. And, and we want to look at how concrete is going to affect those life cycle emissions that I mentioned for buildings and pavements. And we want to look at some particular strategies that can be used to um, lower <clears throat> those emissions and try and understand which ones have um, the most uh, potential. So our first step is actually to frame what are some reduction strategies. And I'm going to break those down by both buildings and pavements. And I probably won't get into all the, the, the details, but we, we've broken down for buildings a couple different system attributes, some related to the production of concrete, other things related to uh, energy consumption. And we framed these reduction scenarios in terms of uh, the things that use energy, appliances, lighting, HVAC, and of course, insulation affects then the energy consumption. Um, disposal of concrete at end of life, can affect the uptake of uh, carbon through um, uh, uh, carbonation. And so we have some scenarios with that. And of course, the, the, uh, uh, the, the um, intensity, the greenhouse gas intensity of the electricity grid is gonna play a role as well. And what we've done is framed um, some projected improvement scenarios and some ambitious improvement scenarios. And so these projected improvement scenarios, they, um, are you know like what they sound there already is some improvement that's happening in all of these sectors right energy codes are getting more stringent the grid is uh, decarbonizing and so what we've done is tried to say if we continued that projection what would happen um, over time when it comes to concrete we're already using um, some low carbon binders right so we've made some projections that way Ambitious scenarios are sort of taking these, but ramping them up. You can see that all the strategies have a technical target, you know, whether it be 50% low carbon binders or adoption of certain types of energy codes, and then timing. So in some ways we've adjusted the technical target. In some, uh, in some scenarios here, we've just adjusted the uh, timing, okay? Now on to the um, pavement side, uh, uh, we have we're framing it in a similar way where we have different system attributes and we have projected improvement scenarios and ambitious improvement scenarios. Um, and similarly, we have some technical targets and timing of those. And, uh, and, and similarly to, to, to pavements, these can vary by region. So, or sorry, buildings. So on the building side, for example, the energy code adoption uh, historically has been different by region. And so we've captured that. And also then going into the future, we have that. On the pavement side, there are similarly different types of practices that are used in different regions. Um, I'd say we have uh, uh, some similar projected uh, impacts associated with use of recycled content. In this case, the materials we're looking at are concrete and also asphalt, um, because a lot of the uh, pavement network is, uh, is asphalt. Um, and, uh, but when it comes to other attributes, whether it be smoothness, stiffness, um, reflectivity, a lot of these are related to the amount of investment that we have in pavements. That is, we, we tried to look at what are changes that we can do when pavement treatments take place, right? That is, um, we, we're not going to go out tomorrow and just make these changes to every single um, lane mile throughout our whole network. Rather, we said, how frequently are treatments being done based on the, uh, the budgets that are available? 
And then when those treatments were done, could we make changes um, to smoothness, stiffness, et cetera? And so it's a lot of it is tied to that budget uh, investment. So we made some uh, estimates on how much budget investment that there is. Um, and then for a lot of these, we said there, there aren't really specific efforts to increase stiffness or reflectivity or increase the use of uh, concrete overlays um, or change the carbon uptake. So there's not much happening here. Whereas in the ambitious scenario, a really big thing that we have is 20% increase in budget. Because when you increase that budget, it allows you to then treat a whole bunch more of the uh, pavement network. And while that's happening, it allows you to do more of these things, but then we also have some scenarios where we increase material stiffness, increase reflectivity, increase utilization of concrete overlays, and then also increase carbon uptake. The other thing that we have in here is that we, we basically, we haven't really messed much with vehicle fuel economy. Rather, we've looked at um, the, the US energy outlook forecast for vehicle fuel economy um, and have, have kind of kept that uh, the same, but that's something that happens in 2050. Uh, another big thing is that um, in this projected improvement scenario, we have sort of linearly increasing implementation of these things to 2045 when roads are treated and then on um, all treated roads after that. And it's similar ambitious, except those things happen uh, at 2035. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the, the, uh, the scenarios, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is, is what are some of the assumptions that we're looking at in terms of the embodied emissions associated with concrete. Um, and uh, we look at basically a, a baseline concrete mixture, um, whereas you, we uh, estimate there are some reductions that can happen and already through use of various low carbon binders, whether that be supplementary cementitious materials, Portland limestone cement, any kind of uh, products like that. Um, then we also have some scenarios where we also have carbon capture and storage in uh, cement. Um, and then we also have some where we add in um, synthetic aggregates that are produced with utilization of captured carbon. And then, um, uh, you know, we, we project that we can get to net zero concrete if we combine all of those different things, low carbon binders, synthetic aggregates, and then uh, captured carbon in the cement. So that's just one of the things that I wanted to highlight. All right, so those are the scenarios. Now we have to have a way to model what is the influence of, um, of uh, implementing those scenarios on the whole network. Um, and this is a pretty big challenge because we have so many buildings and so many pavements across so many regions in this country. So we use what we call a bottom-up approach. And what that means is that we model um, several different types of, uh, of pavements uh, and I'll get into what those are in a little bit. And similarly, several different types of buildings, residential and commercial. Um, and then uh, 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 we get characteristics on those by getting data on pavements and buildings, uh, how many are there, and then how much production is expected into the future. Um, and then what are specific contexts associated here is showing like, you know, state of Massachusetts and then city of Boston. Um, and then what are different ways that we design pavements and buildings? What are different uh, energy codes? So there's a lot that kind of uh, data that we get from the national level that we then hone in on these individuals. And then we do full life cycle assessments of all those different types of buildings and pavements um, and then scale those up uh, to get that national level approach. And just to give you a little bit more about what this looks like on the building side. Um, so as I mentioned, we get specific uh, characteristic buildings, then um, we model energy use phase and embodied impacts, and then we can scale those up to the total. So like, for example, based on the data that we, we have and, and the projections, then we know historically um, what's the square footage of buildings, how much we expect to be new buildings and how much are existing and what that breakdown is by residential and now on those new buildings using the, these kind of prototype designs, we uh, do uh, energy modeling of different types of buildings uh, uh, based on uh, different types of construction methods, you know, how much is steel, how much is wood, and how much is concrete, um, and then also do energy modeling based on different uh, climate zones uh, as well. On the, um, the, the pavement side, it's maybe even uh, in some ways a bit more um, challenging because we have various types of roads. We break them down into uh, the, the, the usual types of uh, road classes, interstates, arterials, collectors, and locals. 
we have different types of traffic, um, different uh, 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 amount IRI is roughness, um, and then also the pavements will, will deteriorate at different rates. And then maintenance and rehabilitation practices will be different uh, as well. And lastly, I mentioned this has to be done in the context of what kind of uh, existing budget that um, we have. So rather than try and actually get data on each individual segment throughout the whole country, instead what we did is basically try to use some data analytics. And so we did some statistical sampling of um, some national level data, and then um, use some of that to develop prediction models for deterioration rate and uh, pavement age. Um, and then that allows us then to look at, uh, at the segment level or kind of individual pavements what is the performance going to be? Um, how do we predict the maintenance and repair actions going into the future? We have life cycle inventory data for various regions, and then we can scale that up to annual greenhouse gas emissions. So, so there's, as you can imagine, there's even more details on all these things, and I won't, I'll spare you um, that, and I'm glad to answer more questions uh, if you have them. But, um, but now let's get back, let's get to the results, sort of what, what did we find? And um, our first kind of result is presented this way. And it's the, uh, this is just shown for buildings right now. So I'll use these pictures to help you keep track of which kind that we're on. Um, this black line here is historical uh, emissions associated with, with buildings. And then going forward uh, is into the, uh, the, the, the future. And we reference everything to 2016. <clears throat> so when I talk about reductions, it'll be relative to those 2016 levels. Now, what you see right here are the different types of buildings that um, we're, we're modeling and their fraction of those uh, emissions going forward. Um, so a big thing you might see is that, you know, this is single family and multifamily residential. They make up about, residential makes up about half compared to the other commercial, but the biggest category overall is actually single family residential. And I think that's interesting because the architecture community is obviously much more focused on these because they're larger structures, but um, single family is not considered, you know, a, a big part of uh, area opportunity for innovation. And I really understand that. But on the other hand, it's a big part of our um, construction. Um, the, the other thing uh, is that these lines here show sort of if we make a improvement in electricity grid and the P means um, the projected scenario, materials production. So each one is on top of the previous one. So here's the electricity grid, then materials production, then appliances, lighting, HVAC, thermal insulation. Here's the total on the uh, projected. It would be too too busy to kind of then add in all the lines, but um, but this is the cumulative total on the um, ambitious right here. So an interesting thing you might see is that the 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 projected uh, emissions it results in about a 47 percent reduction compared to the 2016 levels, um, whereas ambitious is about a 56 percent reduction. Now, what's interesting, first of all, the ambitious and the projected are, are pretty similar, actually, <clears throat> um, meaning in, on the one hand, the, the projected emissions are, are actually pretty ambitious, if you will, though maybe not ambitious enough. The other thing is, though, even with those ambitious reductions, we don't get to that 65 to 75 percent target that I mentioned for the um, uh, uh, Paris Agreement. Now, um, this is looking at that building sector again, but in a slightly different way. This is here showing cumulative uh, 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 emissions um, reductions right here. And so um, this, at the 2016 level, this yellow is the embodied and the sort of teal is the use phase. And then we see these are the reductions that would get us from 2016 down to ambitious. And we've actually broken them down. The orange is ambitious here, but it builds off of the green um, projected, right? So one hand, you're able to see for these different strategies right here, which ones come from ambitious and which ones come from uh, projected. Uh, so one thing that stands out is that the emissions are still mostly associated with that use phase. And hence the, the activities that really lead to the most cumulative reduction comes from the energy related sources. So electricity, appliances, lighting, um, and HVAC. And part of that is that, you know, something like, like uh, HVAC, thermal insulation, um, the, the concrete production, those are mostly going to, or, or they're going to affect new construction. And as we've shown, we're also capturing what's going on with the existing 
um, building network, whereas like the electricity grid is going to affect everything. So, so that's just one of the, um, in terms of um, priorities, we still see that use phase is a big opportunity, but of course, we, when it comes to concrete, we still have ways in which you know concrete affects the thermal insulation, and it still affects these other other categories as well, which which relatively may seem small, but in terms of compared to other actions, can still be uh, significant. Now moving on to uh, pavements, this is showing the historical and future um, pavements GHG uh, emissions. The absolute emissions are lower than the building sector because obviously when it comes to transportation, we're just looking at the pavements here, right? Not all of the transportation network. Um, but what's interesting here, so in the projected scenario, we have uh, fuel efficiency here and materials production, but this is the line for then the, the total projected scenario, whereas these are all then additional act actions that can be done for the ambitious. And here's the, um, the, the total ambitious. So what's interesting here is unlike in the buildings, there's quite a big difference between the total projected and the total uh, ambitious. And you see that here, you get a 20% reduction in projected and a 68% reduction in ambitious, which is right in that um, area, the, the, the target for the, um, the Paris agreements. Um, a few other things to notice, interstates, we, we hear a lot about, obviously a big focus for FHWA and understandably so, they carry a lot of traffic. But when it comes to the emissions, you know, most of them are coming from these other kinds of lower traffic volume roads, um, which is maybe not something that we uh, particularly uh, expected. Another thing you might see is kind of wondering about some of these dips right here. Well, a couple things are happening. Fuel efficiency in vehicles is projected to improve to about 2035, but then flattens off. Um, whereas the number of miles that are traveled is increasing. And that's why you actually get this um, dip here. The other thing is in the ambitious scenario, we're, we're trying to hit net zero on the, uh, the, the new paving materials. And so that's also why it then flattens um, right here. When we look at the uh, cumulative um, reductions, once again, we see that um, uh, 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 the use phase is really uh, much larger than the embodied. <clears throat> the other thing that we see is that, you know, the fuel efficiency improvement is a big part of the projected action savings, um, but we have some pretty significant opportunities then in the ambitious, and that, that's why there's that larger difference between the um, projected and uh, ambitious. We also see these are the things that mostly affect the um, uh, uh, use phase, <clears throat> but I'd say a big difference between buildings and pavements here, you know, the material really plays a much more fundamental role in that use phase, whether it be smoothness or the concrete overlays, obviously are about concrete, um, reflectivity, uh, stiffness. <clears throat> so, so those those really play um, a big part uh, in that. And so the other thing we see is that the materials contribution itself um, has a, a larger contribution to that. Now, obviously, a reasonable question to ask is like, you know, how much is all this going to cost? <clears throat> and so we looked at that by um, characterizing what we call these um, greenhouse gas uh, abatement curves. And the way that you read these is that the width of um, these blocks on this axis, this axis here is CO2 um, reduction, <clears throat> um, whereas this axis here is cost. So a negative number means that it saves money, um, whereas a positive number means that it costs money. So something that's, that's uh, uh, down and wide means that it saves money and saves a lot of CO2. And so that's why you see so many different shapes here. The interesting thing on the building side is that a lot of these um, uh, uh, I, these uh, energy efficiency um, efforts can save money, and so we have a lot of those um, that we see related to lighting, appliances, <clears throat> HVAC, thermal insulation is obviously the part where um, concrete can play a role, and so we see uh, uh, energy savings and cost savings associated with that, um, and the use of um, low carbon binders, which usually um, have a lower lower cost or often of a lower cost than um, uh, the materials they're, they're uh, replacing. So we see savings there. <clears throat> the interesting thing though, is that the, the electricity um, uh, improvements to decarbonize the grid and the use of more of this carbon capture utilization and storage, those are gonna require more uh, 
Um, on the uh, pavement side, uh, we once again see some uh, uh, cost savings associated with using um, recycled content. Um, but you know, the thing that this misses here, and we see some of that. Oops, also in. Um, sorry about that. <clears throat> Went. Um, where we see um, also some, uh, uh, you know, the use of the the CCU um, as as having some cost. But some of these other elements here, like the reflectivity and um, the stiffness, it's a, this chart is a little bit misleading when it comes to cost, also concrete overlay, because they require an increased budget and their, their smoothness uh, benefits associated with that as well, that then enable all these strategies. And so uh, a, a, a developing the abatement costs for the, these are sort of like incremental um, uh, uh, cost additions, but they they rely on having that additional budget and uh, allocating that across these different things is is very challenging. Um, and so we we haven't done that here. But uh, <clears throat> if we make that additional investment where we can then treat more roads, then these are these are sort of the additional costs um, associated with that. But we need that um, that big. Uh, all right, um, the other question that we had was related to a new construction. There's been a lot of um, uh, debate and discussion about what are gonna be uh, embodied and use phase uh, emissions going forward. And so we wanted to focus specifically on that because obviously new construction is where we often can have um, the most uh, opportunity to uh, have an, <clears throat> an impact. And so um, what we did is we made estimates on, here this is showing the building side on the amount of uh, embodied emissions that we expect to see and also use phase emissions. And this this chart up here, the percentage one is showing that breakdown across, you know, all these 30 plus years. The other thing is that the shaded area is the projected emissions, whereas the line is the ambitious um, emissions. And a couple of things might um, stand out. Um, one is that out of these total emissions, about 30% of the new construction emissions are expected to come from uh, embodied. So, you know, we still see the use phase will dominate, even though <clears throat> there are increases in uh, energy efficiency. Um, the other thing that maybe even is hard to tell is that we see that ambitious and projected um, embodied and use phase emissions are almost the same. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, but there are competing mechanisms here. Um, <clears throat> we have more building construction that's taking place um, and increasing, uh, we're increasing the use of materials to make that more energy um, efficient. So even though we're decreasing the impact of concrete, which makes up a big part of the embodied emissions, we're using more materials, which may be concrete or also more insulation, other materials to improve that energy efficiency. So it actually ends up in net kind of almost being uh, the, the same. On the pavement side, we have um, quite a different story. Well, on, on the one hand, we have a similar story in that embodied emissions are once again in sort of that um, uh, 20 to 30 percent range uh, use phase uh, being still um, dominating. But here we see a much larger difference between the, uh, the projected emissions, which are these shaded areas, and the ambitious scenarios, which are the lines right here. <clears throat> um, and so um, a, a big part of that, as I mentioned, is just that um, our projections show that there aren't really a lot of efforts that are, are happening to lower the uh, impacts associated with pavements. And so when you actually increase that investment and have all these other strategies, it can play a much um, larger part. Um, the other interesting thing you see in the embodied side is, you know, obviously we, we mentioned how we're, we're trying to uh, lower the impact associated with the materials to net zero by 2035 under that ambitious scenario. So that's what you see go down. On the use phase, this is also what I mentioned, this issue associated with um, uh, <clears throat> vehicles becoming more fuel efficient until 2035, um, and then that leveling off while the the, the, the uh, vehicle miles traveled is still um, increasing. All right, so wrapping this up, bringing it back to you know one of the the key questions. First of all, can we meet that? What I think what many would consider to be the rather ambitious about 70% reduction in the Paris reduction. <clears throat> 
what was interesting, and I don't think we really expected this, <clears throat> the building's um, uh, ambitious scenario that we calculated was about a 56% reduction. The question is, what would it take to get to 70%? And, and obviously, we were not comprehensive in, in looking at every scenario, right? There are a retrofit, building retrofits um, could be done, and we think that's likely to help us uh, uh, increase that um, because the, the, so much of the building stock is going to be much larger than the amount of new construction that we do. But I think there's also going to have to be further grid decarbonization in order to meet that. Uh, interestingly, the pavements um, under that ambitious scenario is is uh, is already in that um, uh, 70, 65 to 75 percent range. But we have to acknowledge, you know, meeting those ambitious scenarios, they, they have very realistic technical targets. We're, we're not talking about using anything that's um, particularly fancy or untested, but they will require significant changes in policies and investments. And I think we saw that in particular, we're probably gonna need a larger push in the pavement sector because there was that larger difference between the projected and the ambitious. Um, next, going to you know, kind of one of our original questions, what's the role of concrete in meeting targets? Well, one of the key outcomes we see is that that use phase is still gonna dominate building and pavement greenhouse gas emissions. That doesn't mean we, um, <clears throat> so, so that means that we should really particularly be focusing on what are ways that concrete can enable that building energy efficiency and vehicle fuel efficiency, right? And so um, we, we saw there were opportunities to uh, improve uh, thermal insulation in buildings and many different opportunities through stiffness and smoothness to improve vehicle fuel efficiency. Um, I think the other takeaway is that embodied emissions are still significant across these whole sectors, buildings and pavements. So this is all the materials that are used. That's still going to be about 30% of new construction. And concrete is used in just about every building. Even if the, the, the structure is made up of wood or steel, you still have a lot of concrete. So there are still significant opportunities to lower emissions associated with concrete there. Um, and um, we've shown that, you know, lowering embodied emissions or increasing carbon uptake, it's also, it's relatively straightforward to implement and can be done using uh, today's technologies. If we're really going to meet those more ambitious net zero um, targets, then we are going to have to uh, increase our use of carbon capture utilization and, and storage, and that will require some, uh, some more investment and some bigger push in order to get there. So. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you. We, we have uh, more information on our website about the work that we do, and you can contact us um, uh, using uh, this uh, email address as well. The work that I presented here, we're submitting it to a, 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 a journal publication, so it will be um, under review, but we still wanted to uh, share it with you here. And of course, when that uh, paper is published, then we'll be posting it with uh, additional details on our website. Um, and with that, I'll open it up to, uh, to uh, questions. And um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, you can do that using the um, Q&A. Uh, that's a feature. And um, it looks like we already have some questions that are um, coming in. Um, and and uh, I can take a look at those. <clears throat> and I'll start with one. Um, First one is, um, how promising are the options you're familiar with for carbon sequestering aggregates or low slash zero carbon SCMs? I'm familiar with a few, but none that have been rolled out on a wide basis. <clears throat> um, and this is a great question, particularly when it comes to um, looking at the, the, the range of different um, uh, solutions that we have for lowering the embodied impacts of, of concrete. And I, I really would say there's a, a, a spectrum. Um, it seems like you're focusing, the question is focusing a bit more on the more ambitious uh, uh, opportunities in terms of the carbon sequestering aggregates. Let's, let's start with the aggregates, the first one. There are a few co uh, companies, one uh, in the US and one in the UK that are producing these uh, aggregates um, and they, they call them synthetic limestone aggregates where they take captured carbon and then use them to produce these. In the U.S., I'd say it's it's very small scale right now, um, but they have large ambitions to scale up. In the U.K., I think the production is a little bit more. So that's why, once again, that's what makes me come back to that point. Technologically, it's feasible. We probably just need a bit more of a push to people start um, adopting those. In terms of um, SCMs, and I would more broadly call that, uh, you have low to zero carbon SCMs. 
Um, <clears throat> I would say more broadly, we call those low carbon binders because there are actually some uh, uh, cement products that are being produced that are also low carbon, whether it be uh, Portland limestone cement. Um, uh, you may have heard about <clears throat> um, some others that, that even use different types of formulations of cement. There are many technological solutions that have been proposed. Um, and as you said, they haven't been rolled out on a wide basis. I don't think that's because they don't work. I think it's because just when it comes to civil engineering applications, a lot of times there's a, a, a reticence to uh, use, uh, to, to try new things. <laughs> and so, um, but that's where I think having a push to get people to try some of them, you know, put, test them in concrete, see what kind of performance we get, it can definitely happen. Um, and, and it looks like there was another question that was specifically uh, along those um, uh, same <coughs> lines about using the low carbon uh, materials. Um, um, okay, and then there's a question about uh, pavements, about one of the fundamental advantages of a concrete road versus an asphalt is the much lower energy footprint. Uh, the liquid bitumen asphalt binder is a form of energy which needs to be accounted for in an LCA. Is this included in the energy efficiency figure? So um, <clears throat> that question really comes down to the metric of uh, greenhouse gas emissions as opposed to energy. So like, for example, if we go back to, let me go back to that figure that's comparing <clears throat> the different kinds of um, materials, and it's gonna come up in a minute. Um, but like, for example, that's why you see like asphalt being relatively higher on the embodied energy compared to the embodied um, CO2. And so, um, but mo the metric that we were looking at here was about embodied, really about greenhouse gas emissions. And so, um, because of that, then when it comes to asphalt, we just weren't tracking exactly the um, embodied uh, CO2. Okay, <clears throat> um, on, there was a question on slide 25 related to concrete overlays. Can you uh, elaborate the characteristics that we're um, talking about? And maybe actually what I should do is go back to um, the, the strategies that I use. So, so I have concrete overlay listed um, right here. And basically the reason that we um, included that is because uh, a concrete overlay is basically an alternative to an asphalt overlay, um, <clears throat> where basically you have an existing pavement and then you can put concrete on top of it. And that existing pavement can be concrete or um, asphalt. And concrete overlays are used very little um, in this uh, country. Uh, and so we wanted to look at it specifically as an alternative that people could be using because it can be a mechanism to improve both stiffness and smoothness. So it's a pretty basic thing that when we do our math about um, how much of the roads are being treated throughout the country, we then look at what's the possibility if within those treatment scenarios, when a um, <clears throat> when uh, uh, an overlay could be done, what would happen if there were additional use of those um, concrete overlays? All right, um, <clears throat> let's see. Another question is how does the embodied carbon of concrete versus insulation compare uh, on an R value basis? And wow, that's kind of a, that's a, it, it's a great question. I very much understand where it's coming from, um, <clears throat> but it's a little bit uh, complicated um, because uh, we don't just um, usually like a lot of the buildings that we have right now, we rarely have just one material that's being used as the insulation. So for example, one of the most common things um, that we do in a, a, for concrete building construction these days is called insulated concrete forms, where the forms are made out of insulation and then they pour concrete in the middle and the insulation becomes um, <clears throat> uh, part of the building. And so, um, so, so the, the short answer is I, I, I maybe we'll have to get back to you and if you could uh, email us and, and re remind me. Um, I think concrete can, does have very well uh, insulative properties, but actually the reason why it's often attractive for use in a building is because of its thermal mass. And that means it's actually, it's a balance between how much insulation there is but also with the timing with which it releases uh, energy. And so that means that like in a, in a 
climate where you have uh, high heat during the day and coolness at night, it can store the coolness and then release it slowly during the day. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, so, so it's, I would just say that basically when you're looking at the building energy performance, just focusing on the R value of the concrete compared to insulation um, is, uh, is, is maybe not quite the right comparison. All right, there's a question about can we access the recorded webinar and slides? Um, absolutely, the webinar will be uh, posted to our YouTube uh, channel. And uh, there will be, if you're on our mailing list, then there will be a follow up about when you can um, um, access it there. And so we'll be glad to get to that. Um, what geographies do you see as being the most prolific in uh, cement and concrete um, production? And that's definitely something that we uh, incorporated into uh, our analysis because we really got into what's the regional use of buildings and pavements. Um, <clears throat> and, and not surprisingly, the geographies that use the most are the ones where they have the highest population and hence have the most building construction and most pavements. And so uh, generally we think of the top three as being Texas, Florida, and California. Um, and once again, because of that population and then uh, construction that we see happening. All right, another question, what's the relationship between improved stiffness and smoothness and embodied carbon of concrete? <clears throat> is more cement required for increased um, stiffness? Um, that's a, a, a great question, and um, we can think about it in a couple uh, different ways. <clears throat> um, it, once, part of it just depends on what's your uh, baseline material, right? So if we're just comparing like an existing concrete pavement to a newer one, um, an existing pavement, if it's been around for a long time, any pavement deteriorates. And so um, when you uh, then create a, either a new pavement, or I mentioned you can do a concrete overlay, or there's also a technology called diamond grinding, where you can basically just kind of sand, use a, a giant belt sander to kind of smooth out the pavement. <clears throat> that case, the smooth it has almost no embodied carbon because you're just removing material to make it smoother. Um, but uh, generally by uh, material properties, so if you're comparing it to um, asphalt um, uh, uh, on a, a per thickness basis or per uh, embodied carbon basis, it, it concrete generally will give you more stiffness um, bang for your buck. And it doesn't necessarily have to come with the use of more uh, cement at all. So there are ways that we can create low embodied carbon mixtures while still maintaining that smoothness and stiffness. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely not tied only to uh, cement. Okay, <clears throat> there's a question about, um, do we break out carbon emissions between infrastructure and buildings. Um, I'd be interested to know the contribution of pavement, but also bridges, dams, et cetera. And I've not seen those figures. And that is true. We did not look at those other non-pavement um, infrastructure uh, components. And we certainly had data. So we only looked at buildings and pavements. Um, and it wasn't because we didn't think that they weren't uh, important. It was just that we, <clears throat> we when it come, comes to modeling that whole life cycle, we had a lot more expertise um, with pavements, whereas modeling the life cycle elements of the bridges and dams uh, each kind of have their own uh, unique elements. So. Okay, um, slide 29, what are the different strategies that distinguish between projected and um, <clears throat> ambitious? And so uh, hopefully I answered that, but maybe I'll go back to um, the, the, probably the best way to um, be able to frame that is looking at um, the comparison of these different <clears throat> strategies right here. It's coming up. And so under the projected improvement scenario, for pavements in particular, we, we, you know, we can look at, like I said, let's take out the vehicle fuel economy, which just followed that no energy out, uh, sorry, the US energy outlook forecast, okay? Under material production, you know, I can get into more of the details about how we looked at, we're, we're already starting to increase use of uh, recycled content. Um, whereas in the ambitious, we said, we're gonna try to get to uh, zero impact mixtures and do that on all roads by 2035. Um, the big difference, though, on these other ones is that we used a pretty flat budget compared to what we're currently doing. 
Um, and uh, whereas under the ambitious, we had 20% uh, more budget. And the thing about that 20% more budget, a key thing is it allows you to then pave much more frequently and cover more area. Um, the other thing is that under current projections, we don't see people doing a big push to <clears throat> change any of these things right now, whereas under the ambitious, we saw a lot more of that. And that's why I think, uh, particularly under pavements, we see a much bigger difference between this projected improvement scenario and the ambitious. All right, uh, next question about something that I very much glossed over. How was the carbon uptake of in-use concrete calculated in your models? And uh, I, I wish I could have gone into that more, but, but thank you for bringing up the question because it allows me to address it. <clears throat> There's two types of carbon uptake. One is in use of uh, the pavements in this case. Um, we looked at uh, carbon uptake that happens just through uh, uh, carbonation <clears throat> um, because there's an exposed surface of that and there are, there are some pretty standard models that are available to calculate that um, uh, carbon uptake that we use and I can share those uh, sources later. <clears throat> um, in, in the building side, we did not account for that, not because we don't think it's important, it's just concrete use in buildings is an exposed surface area is more complicated to estimate. And so we didn't have a good way to estimate that right now. And that's actually a, a research project we have going forward. However, in both of them, buildings and pavements, we did look at scenarios of uh, 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 carbon uptake at end of life. <clears throat> and with that, we just estimated how much concrete is used, and then what would happen if you spread it out for a year or two to allow carbon uptake to occur over time. And in that case, we use the same carbon uptake models. We just change the amount of surface area that's uh, available. Okay, um, the, early in the presentation, there was a pie chart showing <clears throat> a distribution of carbon emissions, industrial buildings, transportation, is the carbon from cement production being counted twice in this accounting? And that's uh, also a good question and one that <clears throat> I kind of glossed over. But the answer is no. These um, emissions, and I'm bringing up the chart right here, this is from the uh, US EPA's greenhouse gas inventory. And in particular, when I'm focusing here on fossil fuel combustion, um, and that's fossil fuel combustion associated with electricity production, and then also like in the case of cars, direct emissions from the cars or in buildings, direct emissions from burning natural gas. Um, and <clears throat> so, so there's no materials that go into either of these. So all the cement production and frankly, the, you know, any other emissions associated with concrete come from this industrial sector right here. And um, uh, uh, like I mentioned, the US um, <clears throat> cement production makes up about 1.5% of um, all these emissions and, um, uh, within uh, industrial there. So. All right, let's see, a lot, a lot of questions. Um, <clears throat> so there's a question about how does cement or concrete compared to asphalt in greenhouse gas emissions? Um, and um, that is uh, a little bit tricky to answer because of course I can tell you on a per unit weight basis, um, which is what I have um, in this chart right here, for example, so you can see the embodied CO2 emissions, depending on what type of concrete that you're talking about per unit weight, you know, it's about the same. But I don't think it's the right question to ask because usually what we talk about is what's the functional unit that you're comparing it against. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, like basically how much asphalt do you need to carry a certain load and how much concrete do you need to carry a certain load. And um, we that is very much based on context we say so uh you know what's the climate what's the amount of traffic and so um kind of saying which one has a lower impact ends up being you need to kind of do a specific case study of uh, different uh, pavement designs so um, there's a question about green aggregate. Is it produced artificially or is it natural? In this case, we were talking about a specific type of what we call synthetic limestone aggregates. And those are produced um, so then synthetically. Uh, and there's a process that's used by which um, it, it basically um, relies on this process of mineralization where um, CO2 from industrial sources can be combined with um, some other materials that they use as a seed and essentially they use that CO2 to grow um, around it. And so, uh, so it's very much synthetic. <clears throat> 
Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Will um, slides be made available? Like I said, the the um, in terms of uh, the the this will be on um, YouTube, and if you want um, slides, you can contact us uh, uh, directly. So. Let's see, um, here's another question. Do you foresee a scenario where alternative construction materials um, start to replace concrete? And the example that they gave was, um, was mass timber. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the tricky thing about this, so if the example here is specifically focusing on um, buildings, the building sector, as I showed, is very large. And, um, <clears throat> You know, kind of getting into uh, some of the results right here, you can see there's many different types of buildings that have many different uh, uses. So even in single family, where the vast majority of construction in single family in this country we call is, is wood construction, but by weight, there's actually more concrete in the uh, foundation. And so that's why I say, regardless, even if you have a steel structure building, there's still going to be a lot of um, concrete in it. For many of those applications where concrete is being used, you know, it's it, like I said, in foundations and in <clears throat> uh, other kind of some other structural areas, it's hard to see kind of um, uh, materials replacing it there. When it comes to structure, practice is really very regionally. Uh, in some regions of the country, you see a lot of concrete structures being built, in other places, steel. We are starting to see mass timber being um, used. And as far as what happens in the future with some of that, there's a lot of complicated dynamics going on. One is uh, economics, um, and uh, <clears throat> economics will dictate that, which will vary quite a bit. Um, I think when it comes to mass timber, uh, uh, forestry practices are going to play a big role with that, and that's a big um, uncertainty. But in terms of uh, environmental impact, I think what we've shown is that uh, you know concrete can very much um, play a role there because we can lower the embodied impacts of the material and we can use it to also um, lower uh, energy emissions as well. <clears throat> um, there's a question in construction. We have an elaborate energy code to meet and reduce operational carbon emissions. What standard would embodied carbon emissions fall under? Uh, and that is a great question, and and pretty much we don't have embodied emissions within energy codes uh, at all right now. <clears throat> um, but there is there's a single example here in the U.S. Uh, of Marin County, um, which is just outside of San Francisco, of having created uh, a building code that specifically talks about embodied impacts of concrete. So it can be done. Um, I don't know if that means there's a trend in which that's going to be happening more. But in that example, they had to specifically decide to do it. So at least right now, we don't see that as falling under um, in energy codes. <clears throat> um, there's a question about concrete overlays. Uh, and do you mean white topping? And uh, yes, that is another term for it. Um, and it's it's and why is it not used very much in the USA? Um, I, I wish I could say. I think it has more to do with just sort of um, People are used to paving in certain ways, and uh, and concrete overlays isn't really a big part of it now. Um, but uh, technically, they're used in many parts of the country and have been for a long time. And so um, I think that's why we had it under the more ambitious scenario that that increases, because it, it's more about a change in behavior rather than a development of a, a technology. Um, all right, we have a question about for the pavement use phase, what assumptions do you have concerning the share of electric vehicles and how um, sensitive, let's see where that go, um, <clears throat> that is to the um, re result. And we do account for in those future scenarios, um, uh, the, uh, the fact that electric vehicles will be used um, and, uh, uh, but still based on those projections in 2050, um, they still predict uh, a lot of fossil fuel uh, uh, consumption. So um, right now we're at the, the top of the hour and I want to respect everyone's time. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to uh, all the questions. There's still quite a few that are uh, left. And so, but as I mentioned, <clears throat> you know, I had on our last slide, if there's stuff we weren't able to um, uh, 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 address, um, please feel free to contact us using this uh, email address. Also, please, if you're not already, you can use that to join our uh, mailing list. You can find out about future public webinars and other activities that we have um, going on. So um, with that, we'll end. And uh, uh, thank you very much to everyone who participated. And we'll look forward to seeing you again 
on a, a future webinar.